all for being here today for our third parent advisory council meeting of the year. Um, I know this is not the nicest day outside, so I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here. Um, so our first presentation, we welcome, as I had indicated, um, during our parent advisory council, we'll always um, either, um, I'm making my best effort to either bring a presenter in from the community, um, as we had the Middletown Library, or sharing resources um, that are out in the community for our parents. So um, we welcome today from Bayshore Family Success, uh, Success Center, Darby, and from Literacy Volunteers, Jana. So we appreciate you being here today, and there's some information and resources they have that um, are being passed out, and I welcome them up. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Darcy Dobbins. And um, with the Bayshore Family Success Center, I sent around a little packet of our calendar and our flyers. So um, just to do a little brief history, Family Success Centers are actually state-funded programs. There's 57 Family Success Centers throughout New Jersey. Um, it just happens that the Family Success Center that I run, the funding comes through the YMCA of Greater Monmouth County. Not every Family Success Center is a YMCA program, and YMCAs don't have, I think they only have two of the Family Success Center grants. So um, Family Success, we like to say quick and easy, um, we like to help families solve problems before those problems become full-blown crises. So that means that we um, have databases of all of the local resources that could help a family, government resources, which would be the government programs, the SNAP program, Section 8 program, um, lots of you know um, different types of government programs that are implemented uh, locally or through the county or through the state. Um, and the next bucket of resources would be um, private nonprofits like the YMCA, um, this, this, you know, you name it, Mount County is very rich in resources, so we know what agency has what grant and is doing what, so we can um, uh, give the family the appropriate resource so they don't have to go crazy trying to find the resource. And then the third bucket of resources is usually faith-based resources. Those are going to be your pantries. Um, food pantries, uh, those are AA programs, they're doing a lot of different things right now. So that's when we say we like to help families solve problems before they become full blown crises. Um, we're a prevention program, we're not um, a treatment program. I uh, just want to clarify that our YMCA in Monmouth County has a very clinical branch called Counseling and Social Services. My outreach program does come under counseling and social services, but we are not clinical. We don't give mental health therapy at the Family Success Centers. Um, it's completely voluntary. It's more like a community center that you would go to if you have a question or if you need help. So our primary bread and butter is um, linking families to resources. In addition to that, we do a lot of parenting um, classes. We have resume writing classes. We like to bring uh, speakers on current topics that, that parents ask us about. Um, so we're also doing a lot of education. I do have a Zoom parenting class going on right now. Um, it's uh, systematic training for effective parenting for um, parents of children under six. But I will tell you, it's the same concept. It doesn't matter if your children are older. Their class is great. It's very simple. Um, it's on Thursday nights, 5.30 to 6.30. And it's seven sessions that I just keep rolling. So if you miss a session, you can just wait until that chapter comes back again um, and jump into that Zoom. And if any parents need a certificate of completion, once they complete all seven sessions, I give them a certificate. Um, so we do information referral, we do um, parent education, and the last thing that we do is family-friendly programming. Um, so I know that everybody here knows that children are very expensive. Um, it's expensive to support them, but it's also expensive for them just to have fun. Um, just taking a kid to the movies nowadays can be like $25 without snacks. So we do things like bingo nights with the families and the kids. Uh, breakfast, you know, we've had breakfast with Santa. We do Easter basket making, craft, everything. Every one of our programs is free. We don't charge for our programs for funded. Um, the catchment area that Bayshore Family Success Center is responsible for is right from um, Keyport 
all the way down to Highlands and into Middletown. So that's my catchment area. There's three family success centers in Monmouth County. The other one is in Long Branch, and Long Branch is a pretty big geographic area right there, so they mostly service Long Branch. Um, and then the third one in Monmouth County is in Asbury Park. Um, and they, they service Asbury Park, Neptune, and those general areas. All family success centers won't turn anyone away, depending on if they're another in someone else's catchment area, but we do try to let them you know, know that it's more useful or easier for them to access the programs close by. Um, another one of the programs I'm doing right now is a baby pantry. So in our area, we realized that we had a lot of food pantries. And the food pantries sometimes have diapers and formula, sometimes they don't. It may not be the size you need or it may not be the formula you need. So we started a, a baby pantry. It goes twice a month, the first Friday of every month. Parents register and they tell us the size of the diaper that they need and if they need formula. Um, and we try to provide it. It's all donor based. So you may have seen um, drives that we have. Lots of parent programs have been um, helping us fund the diaper drive, diaper pantry. That way, the YMCA has been very good about um, doing appeals for us with all of our employee information. So that's been helpful. And we have a lot of great community volunteers that we take donations of diapers, wipes, and formula. I don't take donations or distribute used baby clothing or baby items. It's strictly diapers, wipes, and formula. And that's been very successful. It was very successful. Unfortunately, it, was, it became more successful during COVID, um, but it's a resource we didn't have in the Bayshore area. I'm always trying to bring service providers to our area because as we all know, we're kind of separated from, from a lot of the other um, areas and we're far from freehold. Um, so we are, you know, nine years um, old at this point. I'm gonna pass this around. I didn't make a copy for everybody, but if you just wanna take a look, it's just a little year by year annual report of some of the things we do. We measure how many unduplicated families come every year, how many people attend our programs, volunteers. I have some diaper pantry information on there, just to give everybody a sense of how many people we're meeting. We're nine years old this year. We're located in the Monmouth County Park building on Route 36. Um, and next year, we're gonna be celebrating our 10 year anniversary for Bayshore's Family Success Center. Um, I love to come to events like this. Um, a lot of people do know about us, but a lot of people still don't, or they think that we're another agency. Um, so that's the overview of us. Um, and I brought a colleague here with me today from Literacy Volunteers. We don't do anything specific in Spanish, but we can link people to different programs and we can help guide people. Before I let Jana take over, I wanted to see if anybody had any more specific questions. Sure. Um, what sort of coordination do you do with the school district? I mean, one thing that pops to mind, um, my daughter went through the preschool program in Middletown, and um, it allots for low income eligible kids, and we all know early intervention is so important. And, um, and I can remember through the years, it was just like one child. So is there any outreach or any help in, in different ways to say if there's somebody that's income eligible, that, that you can educate them on the opportunities to get into a free preschool program at the district? Those sorts of things, I, I don't know what sort of coordination. So we send, all, there's a couple of things, we send all of our information to all of the school superintendents, the school nurses, there's a couple of contacts that we have, and I know that they've been exceptionally good at putting our stuff on the virtual backpack, sending it out, helping to get the word out. Um, something like that, we could partner with somebody to have an information session. It could be at the school, it could be at my center. We also partner with Child Care Resources, and they're the county organization that does the subsidy for child care and all different forms of child care can be after care, can be preschool. So we actually just had them at a event, a financial open house event we had last week, last Wednesday night, and they were represented there. So the family could walk in and with other agencies too, AHA and Bloom Again and different financial health organizations. So we can help those family yeah, fill that out. In, you're on the ground yep. with these people that might have a need. So I didn't know, you know, if you are able to kind of refer them to say, you know, this preschool option may be, you know, or yeah, something we, like we that. definitely can do that. And, and we, as part of our being under the YMCA, we do meet with the school system when we come to uh, 
uh, provider meetings all the time. I know the YMCA is here after school, so that may be coming. There may be more information coming through the aftercare program, which I, I don't work yeah. you know, specifically yeah. for them, but I certainly could come in when they come in and give a presentation at, at any point. But thank you, because that's something that I can have in the back of my mind and try to reach out and get something going for that. Yeah, for people that can't afford traditional preschools, and then again, when they don't come into the school system in kindergarten, we never attended a school. It, so, which is, so. that's a big issue right now, and we want all these kids to be going to preschool because New Jersey believes that it, it's for the best for the kids, the parents, the school, they become prepared, um, and there is funding for that. There's state funding to help subsidize the cost of preschool. Um, I don't know how it works with the schools. I think it might be set up a little bit different, but you know, we also work with um, Children's Home Society where they're, they're helping identify the children that might need more help. Um, and the name of the program is escaping me right now, but the ages and stages where they come in and if they feel that a toddler is not um, hitting all their marks, uh, that they can come in and do, what is it, first inter early intervention, early intervention. So we work with them as well. Um, and they'll have, um, you know, at the baby pantry, for instance, they're, they're meeting parents, they're there, but they come to the baby pantries, they do the ages and stages assessment, um, and they can link people up to the um, early intervention program. It's so important. Yeah, and it really is. Yeah. It really is. And then educating parents. So some parents believe they want to keep their child home with them and they're able to stay home with them. Um, and if you are able to give the child a lot of experiences and a lot of different stimuli, that's great. But we try to educate the moms and, and sometimes the single moms or young moms how important it is to socialize the young child and how much more they're learning by being with a group of children and being um, having formal education. Uh, and then we help them find the funding for it. So that's, that's, that's more of what Family Success does because we're a prevention program is creating a one-on-one -on -one relationship with their mom, letting her know what's available to her in a friendly way, not in a judgmental way, and then the hope is that bringing her in in a trusting way to link up to these programs. Okay. Um, sure. I was just wondering if you've ever connected with some of the clubs at the high school specifically. Like I know my daughters are in Key Club, which is very service-oriented. There might be an opportunity for you guys to connect with the advisors at both North and South to maybe do a diaper drive through Key Club at the school. That might be an interesting way to educate the kids on some of the resources that are available in our town. I'm gonna give you my part because okay. we did work with the Key Club at one point, and I don't know what, it's always related, like you need a name and yeah, a face, yes, yeah. right? So there, something happened with the relationship there, I don't know if someone moved on okay. or what, but we, we do partner with the advisors from the Honor Society, the High okay. School Honor Society, and those are our pool of tutors. So we do free peer-to-peer -peer tutoring from, the tutors can be in kindergarten up to eighth grade, but it's the high school honor society that does the tutoring and they get their hours through us. So we give them their hours and write them a nice letter and it can be via Zoom, it can be in person, um, but COVID obviously put a damper on some of that. We're trying to reinvigorate those relationships, so Absolutely. definitely gonna give you my card. And yeah, give pass it on to my kids. Yeah, yeah. This, that's exactly what we're here to do, is we're here to create relationships, keep relationships, and, and make meaningful programs that, that work for everybody. So thank you. Yes. Um, would you be willing to go to like a PTA meeting? Sure, I'd love. I love when people invite me to PTA meetings. You can't usually get an invite, so I'll be following up with you too. <laughs> you might want to check with your president. <laughs> I'm a parent um, uh, in Leonardo, so your place is within walking distance for a lot of you know, yeah, people that are here at least. So. Yeah, if you invite me, I will come. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, well, I'm hanging out here, and uh, my colleague John is going to come up next. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to get out of the house. I've worked in my house for two years. This is my first time to, to make the community presentation. If I get a little nervous, please excuse me. I had to write down some notes. So I'm Jana Evan. I'm the program director for Literacy New Jersey Monument. We used to be called, we were literacy volunteers. Everyone knew us as literacy volunteers. But in 2019, right before the lockdown, we merged with Literacy New Jersey. So it's kind of like our umbrella group. And it's great because they offer all the administrative support, all the fundraising, and I can just focus on the program. 
So what we do is we train a volunteer. First of all, our program is only for both students and tutors 18 and over. We don't serve kids, we don't work with kids. So you have to be 18 to become a tutor or 18 and over to be a student. And we uh, train volunteers to work with um, ESL, which is English as a Second Language, so immigrants, and basic literacy students. Um, you'd be surprised how many people people born in this country who can't read or write. They can speak, but they can't read or write, and they have problems. They either have dyslexia, or they were just passed from grade to grade, they had them dropped out of school for whatever reason, so we do serve that community as well. Most of our students, I would say 85% are ESL students uh, from all over the world. You think just from, they're Spanish speaking? No, they're from all over the world. They have about 30 countries represented. And when the lockdown happened, our program, which uh, would meet in, so we, um, we train the tutors. Tutors have to go through like a five week training session where they learn techniques of working with, a, with adults with literacy issues. And we had to revert the whole program to online. So right now we're still online. Um, and the people that we get are kind of pretty good at working on the computer, right? You have to get on Zoom, you have to know how to get on, you have to, you know, no kind of basic uh, information. We are, my office is in Long Branch in um, the Brookdale uh, Community College building, and I will be going in once in a while, but right now everyone is so used to and, and likes working virtually that it's gonna be hard to bring people back. And when we met in person, people would meet in, never in anyone's house, never, never, you know, we don't do background checks on either our tutors or students, so we would meet in libraries, in um, uh, Starbucks, coffee shops, things like that, because we don't want anyone to get anything, you know, any, any craziness going on. Um, in addition to ESL classes and basic literacy classes, we offer citizenship classes. So I had a really successful 12-week online program um, last summer where we had eight people in the class and half of them already got their citizenship. So we were so excited and they were so, so excited. They sent us a picture with a flag and they, you know, they get sworn in uh, right after um, they, they pass the test. We also offer digital literacy, um, uh, a d digital literacy program. Again, it's online. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing because it's teaching people who don't have digital literacy, digital literacy, but it's online. So it's kind of hard to kind of get that going. So we will be doing that more when we go back to face to face. And we are, and, and I am starting to do that to go back uh, by appointment um, in my office. Um, uh, in terms of parents, how we serve parents, like right now we have. Um, my biggest class, again, everything is Zoom, still online, is a 35-person class, uh, beginning, intermediate, and advanced um, ESL parents of Long Branch students. So if you know of anyone in your community or in your school who needs help with reading or writing, or they need help with speaking, reading, and writing, that you can get in touch with me, I have my card, and we can set up, we can either a lot of the tutors do want to start coming back in person, so if we can find a space, even you know, at Darcy's place, where we can meet and you know have a class, that would be great as well. Or we could do it online. So um, right now I'm serving, and it's just me. Um, I used to have two uh, two people working with me, but it's just me, and I serve close to 100 students, and I have 41 um, volunteers right now. And the volunteers are just wonderful. They're just people who really want to help. Uh, uh, people get on their feet. The other thing that our program does, uh, so people come to us and, say, and I say, why do you want to learn English? Or why do you want to improve your literacy skills? Because I just, I want to learn English, I want to speak. Like, no, that's not how our program works. Our program works on goals. So every student has to have at least one to two specific goals, SMART goals that are measurable, right, that you can, so getting a library card, um, coming to a teacher, uh, being able, a lot of it, a lot of the parents, it focuses around their kids and like reading, even as simple as reading a book to them, being more involved with literacy activities, coming to a PTA meeting. A lot of the parents who don't speak English very well are very nervous about coming to a meeting like this, right? They can't communicate, they, they're they very embarrassed. So, um, you know, so that's what we do. So we really help people um, achieve their goals. I'll tell you one story and I hope I don't cry because I cry every time I tell the story. This one man came to a 70-year-old man, his name was Claude, and he said we could share his story, so I'm okay sharing it. Um, for 40 years, he hid the fact that he was illiterate from his family. Every time I do this, it's crazy. So, and, I, and his, I have, okay, I'm sorry. 
So um, one of our uh, tutors, Helen, has worked with him for the past year and a half. He went from not being able to read a street sign to writing an essay that's published in, in our book that we, we have a Martin Luther King Day event. The last uh, uh, two years has been virtual. And he wrote an essay, and it's published in this book. So every, I'm sorry, every time I tell the story, he's just such a wonderful man. And he didn't even tell his uh, grandchildren. When his grandchildren graduated from college, that's when he told them that he's been hiding the secret all his life. And um, so he's like one of our success, success stories. And um, I'm sorry, just every, every time, every time. He's just been like, so that's what we do. We really change lives. Our program really helps to change lives, and it helps people to you know, move from point A to point B, to get a job, to get there. We also have a high school uh, equivalency um, HSC program. Again, it's online right now, but it'll be in person shortly. People who want to get their GED. And it's really hard right now. The test is, has gotten even harder, so we help them with that as well. We work with both ESL and basic literacy students. The basic literacy students are the American born students. So, so that's what we do. Um, so if you have anyone who's interested, I have my card here. I have some of the books with Claude's essay in there. If anyone's interested, I have some, yes. Do the volunteers have proficient that they have to be in yellow? Like they have to be fluent in Spanish? Or? No, well, that's a great question. So when Darcy introduced me, so like I speak Spanish and I speak Russian. I was born in Latvia, but that's, but our, our, but our tutors do not have to speak any other language and they don't have to have any teaching experience or anything. It could be any, any profession. And we have some people actually come to us, well, I have a PhD in da, 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 da. It doesn't matter. You still have to take our training because it's a specific way of teaching. Um, and so everyone has to go through a training to, to become a, a volunteer with us. Okay. But, and they don't have to speak another language. Great question. So a lot of times, like right now, I, I'm getting a few calls from Ukrainian immigrants who have just made it here. Right. But if they don't speak at all or can't read, it's very hard for volunteers to work with completely. You know, they have to speak a little, be able to at least say, how, how are you? Just basic words, you know, because we're, again, they're volunteers. I don't want to put the onus on them to work with completely, you know. So great, great question. But yes, you don't need any kind of experience. We train you and you don't have to speak another language. So, I mean, it helps, but we don't, we don't want you to because that's like a crutch, right? If you could speak Spanish, you can speak another language, then you'll speak, you know, they'll want to speak with you in their language, so. Yes. In terms of timing for the tutoring sessions, are they certain hours or is it kind of never works with the tutor and the student? So right now I have a waiting, uh, oh, you mean when they meet? Like time of day. I'm just wondering like, oh, if there well, are like parents who are able to work after hours or others who are able to work during the day, like when, when, right. when would you need? Great question. So um, the tutors and the students both fill out applications where it says, when are you available? And a lot of the matches are just because they can meet at that time or yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of our students work, obviously they work multiple jobs, so a lot of the classes are at night or the, the tutors meet at night. It's very rare that I have day, daytime um, classes. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So I can 
students' questions. schools your child is with. Um, you can check multiple if you have children in um, you know, different schools. Great, so the first is sectioned off, um, thanks to Mr. Rizzolo who helped me develop the survey. Um, for ESEA Title I Part A, it's going to ask, and it just explains kind of what I explained in the beginning, part of one is including basic programs operated by local education agencies. And this is just a way to um, help you know, our students um, provide equal opportunities. And the first set of check boxes asks, what do you believe is the best use of the Title I-A funds? So the options are pull out support and instruction, uh, push in support instruction, um, having like a before or after um, school program, uh, extended aid program, and then reduction of student teacher ratios in Title I schools. So, um, in the past, that's been a large value to us because we're able to um, provide additional staffing to reduce the amount of students in a class, to make it smaller class sizes, um, to provide intervention as far as like math specialists and uh, reading specialists in the classrooms. So all that falls under the reduction of student teacher ratios in Title I schools. And there's also another option. Yes. Good question. Do you only get the question about the Title I funding if you selected a Title I school as your home school? No, because the, the money, because we are targeted, it really um, go like, well, most of our schools are targeted. Um, Bayshore is um, considered targeted SIA, and then Ocean um, is considered school-wide. So we have different statuses um, of the schools. So a school-wide school means that the money's able to benefit all of the students. Okay. A targeted school is where the schools looked at um, you know, when we have to fill out the application. Um, I think you might have been here for my first presentation on like the whole ESEA grant, like in the beginning of the year. That asks for uh, you know, how many students are in your school. It asks how many students are on free and reduced lunch. Um, it asks like a lot of like um, demographic questions and then it assigns a certain amount of funding to a particular school. Like we don't pick the schools that get the funding. Okay. Through, the, through the grant and through the questions, it calculates what schools meet the criteria to um, earn you know, the grant. But if you, like if you're home, if my kids go to a school that doesn't get categorized as title anything, does my opinion still affect what is happening in other schools in the district? Um, I guess that's my question. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I would say it would help us know for future opportunities, like if you're at a particular school, because we save the data, it collects all of it, um, and it would just tell us like, okay, like we, we would primary, we would look at all the results, but then we would filter it to look at what schools, like I don't know yet, because the grants haven't been out for FY23 okay. yet, so when it does come out, like, okay. Because uh, to give you an example, some of our schools that are Title I this year haven't been Title I in the past. So we don't know right now who is, so we just have to go on the, you know, let's get everybody's feedback. And then we go and say, let's look at all of the Ocean Avenue parents and see, or stakeholders and see what they selected. If they exactly. Select. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Because, for example, at Thompson, anybody that fills out is going to say they want to reduce the student teacher ratio thinking of their own school, which is not Title I. Right. Um, so where they really have no information on, you know, the benefits of any of those other factors there. Yeah, so and the important thing to remember have to parse, parse yeah. it out because that's a good point, Vera. Like it, it's always important to look at the data like as a whole yeah. and then to break it out by school. But it's it's always good to remember we're very like fortunate in the district that we do a lot of these things in other ways, like through local funds or other grant funds. You know, right now we have extended day programs um, that are funded locally, that are funded through the ARP grant. So there is, you know, a lot of these things are already, you know, being done through some some method. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's like the middle town community, so like our board members can take it, our administrators can take it, our parents can take it. I mean, if you wanted uh, a good way to get things, a paper version in front of parents that they do read is we put them in our baby candy bag. So I don't know if that's the parent they're focusing on, but they live locally and their kids, they may have older kids in the school system, but they can take that where you go. Right. Just let me know if it's a okay. if you use a lot more responses. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, right now we'll probably uh, push it through our portal, Chris. Okay, so that's um, Title I A. Okay, Title II focuses on supporting, supporting effective instruction. Um, so that can look at these particular areas, increasing student achievement um, through the state standards, improving um, effectiveness of teachers and um, administration, and that just means like offering professional learning opportunities for all of them because we all need that to stay current. And then um, providing students access to um, teachers, principals, and school leaders effective. Again, meaning just helping everyone stay current, continue to learn. Um, so these are the options. And anything listed here, it, any of these options are what's listed in the grant as an allowable use. Like we didn't make these up, they are what's listed within um, the grants. So um, first option is offer teacher and administrator training and use of data to drive instruction. Uh, we pretty much do that on a daily basis. Um, fund teaching salary through class size reduction. So we have um, done that in the past, um, funding particular salaries through the grant. Um, other professional learning opportunities, and the difference between these options is this is for language arts and this is for mathematics. And then offering professional learning opportunities uh, to we'll focus on small group instruction. So to help our teachers you know, uh, have additional ways and learn different ways to work with our students in small groups. And then offer professional learning related to students with disabilities and English language learners. So to give you for instance, like. Um, the district is looking at PSYOP training for um, you know, the next school year. PSYOP training um, really provides different ways to help um, you know, English language learners as well as um, specialized. They're basically best practices to help all students. But PSYOP, um, PSYOP training is a pretty intense training, so that's, another, that's an example of that, okay? Um, so that was Title II-I. Um, if you remember from my presentation from the beginning of the year, there's several different, like it's several sub-grants within one um, large grant. It's the ESEA grant, but Title I is its own grant, Title II is its own grant. And um, this is for Title III and Title III immigrant. Um, depending on your population of students and how they register within the district, sometimes you will have um, immigrant students as a population, sometimes you won't. So sometimes you will get you know, funding for that, if you don't have any students that classify as immigrant, then you won't get an allocation for that that particular school year. So it just depends on you know when they come in and register, um, or they actually do the registration online. You know what they fill out and what they fill out for their demographics to know if we would get um, an allocation for Title III immigrant. Okay, so this is Title III and Title III immigrant. There are two different um, types of funding. Uh, they do primarily focus on the English language learner population, um, but Title III, um, let's say Title III is um, maybe one of my uses if I use what's on here. Maybe I'm going to do um, some staff development. So Title III immigrant has to be above and beyond what you can do with your Title III um, funds. You can't use Title III and Title III immigrant for the same thing. So you might um, provide specialized, for Title III, you might um, provide specialized programming for parents of immigrant students to help them get acclimated, to provide them with resources. So I always say it's kind of like, you know, the whipped cream and the cherry on top of the ice cream. So Title III is like one level and then Title III immigrant is another level for just the immigrant students. Um, so this, um, both of these fundings um, help our English language learner population is growing, 
um, you know, uh, over the past few years. So we do have um, parent family engagement. Uh, we can do staff development, professional development. We can buy instructional resources, um, specialized resources to help um, our English language learners, students, any type of resource that's specialized to help that population to um, support you know, increasing student achievement and student growth. Okay, and this is for Title IV. Title IV is a very specific grant. It breaks down to three particular areas, and they're all listed up here for you. Um, providing a well-rounded well education for our students, fostering a safe, healthy, supportive, and drug-free environment, and increasing access to personalized, rigorous learning experiences. So um, when you fill out the Title IV grant, it's a little bit more of a challenge because it does ask you to spend a certain amount of money in each of those three areas, and you have so you're spending a certain percentage. So it calculates it for you, and they do have a certain amount um, of money that you do need to dedicate to technology. So it's really, you know, when you go in, you look at what your allocation is, you have to balance it out between the three particular areas that I just mentioned up here. Okay. So um, things that we've done in the past with Title IV is, um, you know, also non-public schools, also we consult with them, so they do get a portion of the funding if they qualify. So um, we've done things with um, like technology PD in the past, we've done things for um, social emotional, um, you know, things are, uh, focused around providing safe and healthy schools. Um, they do a lot with like um, substance prevention, um, you know, violence prevention, things like that under safe and healthy schools. And these are the allowable uses here. Programs and activities across multiple disciplines, so um, those are different types of interdisciplinary activities that you'd want to provide to the students. Um, build technological capacity for infrastructure of schools. So that's one of the pieces where the technology piece comes in. Drug and violence prevention activities and school-based mental health services. We have done uh, mental health under there as well. Uh, child abuse awareness and prevention programs and any program or activity that focuses on community involvement and that promotes volunteerism. Okay, but again, it's kind of a little bit of a balancing act because you do have to use money under all three of those areas listed at the top. Okay, and that is the ESEA survey. So um, you're, it is um, set up in the back. There are Chromebooks. Um, you can share them, take it, and pass a Chromebook. Um, You know what I'll do? I'll just move the Chromebooks up, and then if anybody has one back here, you guys can start, and then any that you don't want sitting at. And again, it doesn't have to be taken today, but I just thought, um, be nice. You guys are the first ones to take it. <laughs> okay. Um, the password is up on the board. Ocean BS, and then meeting twenty twenty two. So I'm just going to randomly kind of, you guys can share it. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to work. I know. I'm trying to get like some stuff. Okay. 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 So Mr. Rantolo put the survey um, links up on the agenda.
comment. If you don't, if, you know what I mean? Yes, if you prefer to, you don't have to. And I, I mean, yeah. but it's kind of a strange so thing. And then the other thing is that if this goes out to the whole community, um, this is a very complicated, you know, these grants are hard to understand how they're, at, you know, it's right. very complicated. And I'm just worried if it goes out to the whole community, there are going to be people in schools that expect that they will be getting funding for some of these, or, or, um, yeah, or is the potential that they feel like funding is going somewhere else and not to their schools? It's always kind of a sticky, right? So, um, and I don't, I don't know how you educate people on this because it, it is it's, it's so complicated. Right. Well, we will, you know, continue to present in our meetings. Um, it's like we had talked about a little earlier. It's a little difficult because at this point, you know, the grant with it not being even out yet, we can't calculate who gets what and you know who's going to be part of that. We would never want to leave anybody out. Um, but it does help us too because, like, just certain things like professional development is pretty universal. So if we see something listed that is very large majority from the parents. I can say, oh, okay, like the next grant I write, like just kind of keep those things in mind. There's an appetite um, for that, yeah. Yeah, so I'll already like have some sort of prior knowledge of what the parents are saying is needed, you know, within the community, and, so. And you have it by school, too. Right. So that's, that's a good point. Um, so if somebody were to ask and say, okay, we're looking at um, Ocean Avenue, want them to have lower class size, makes sense, whatever. Is it clearly that this money is going to help them? The, the fact that 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 school will be going to lower class sizes that doesn't take away from a school that's not Title One. No, and it's incremental. Love it because this is incremental. Because sometimes in board papers I see like you fund it funds a portion of a salary. Yes, like a whole salary. exactly. So it's all it, it's it's you know yeah it's very. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that the schools that are not Title One wouldn't have that. You know what I mean? Okay. That's so. Some, like you said, like in the board agenda, it does show partial salaries. Yeah. But we we try to put like interventionists and specialists in all of our schools. Right. So, and they may just be funded through a different funding source. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? So, it's not that it would never take away from another to you know provide. Okay. okay. Interesting. Does the state like bind you to use the money in the way that the survey reflects? Is this in any way? I know you just provide this as part of the application and stuff. So they then say, okay, we'll give you this money because your family said they wanted that, so you better use the money. You better. You guys have some discretion when the money. No, comes we in. we have discretion, okay. and and everything through the Department of Education because I've been doing grants a long time is you better be looking at multiple measures okay. to make informed decisions about how you are spending the money and. Like we ha we as a group, like the administration, has to talk about what we feel the best uses of the funding are, and you can see it, it goes through like all the channels of stakeholders. And I just kind of want to make sure that like, I know I have my opinion, but that doesn't necessarily. I'm no education expert. I don't know where the most impact will be. You guys know that, so I just want to make sure that our responses aren't in any way kind of pigeonholing you into a certain. No, way. it's no. Okay. No, it's just like what it's a it's a data point of consideration. Okay among many yeah and especially like our schools you know it's like the people with the boots on the ground right so like being sure like all our schools have a learning design team that's made up of like multiple stakeholders within the school so they come together um you know several times a year to talk about based on the data what are we seeing as the needs and the teachers are like yeah this is really a need for us you know um we had a meeting last week um that was ran by our um, professional development, um, um, Ms. Orzoko Devin. She presented, we had stakeholders from every um, building here to talk about professional development needs for next year. So we gathered a list from there. So it's a matter of taking you know, our learning design team feedback, our administration feedback, your feedback, kind of putting it all together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So the teachers take this or they take their own survey? Uh, it, it's a it's a combination, yeah, yeah. Because the principals are like always meeting with their staff, so they bring like you know yesterday we had an admin council meeting, so they bring feedback to those meetings. Um, they have data meetings, you know, so 
um, and we're always like articulating. So it's a combination of like a survey and then what we're, you know, you always, one thing with data is that you want to be consistent and it's ongoing, you know what I mean? So you always want to keep collecting data throughout the school year because things change. And again, this is um, for the district to provide, you know, required by the DOE, but in no means if you're not comfortable taking it, you don't have to take it, please don't feel pressured. Um, it will be going out like later today, so if you feel like you want to take it at home and you're more comfortable doing that, that's fine too. And I'm always here if you have any questions, you can always reach out um, with any questions that may come up. So for the sake of time, I'll just continue on, if that's okay, to... So I know we've talked a lot about um, like our ARP funding as we were, you know, it's been brought up, I think every uh, either pick or pack meeting that we've had. So um, I just want to kind of give you an update where we are and, you know, it's always important that we get feedback as we move through the process. Um, and I don't mean to, I hope I'm not boring you because I know we've talked about this the past, you know, a couple pick and pack meetings. But we always kind of like to, you know, the way the DOE talks about it is they want you to talk consistently about, you know, how grants are being used, um, how you're consulting with your stakeholder groups. So um, this is, you know, to provide you that kind of update and uh, see if you have any questions. And always, we welcome feedback. So if you have any feedback, please let me know. Okay. So. Um, in the ARP grant, there is one pot of money, which is ARP ESSER, and I just want—I'm giving a brief overview because I know you know some of you may not have been here in the past meetings, um, so I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So we have an ARP ESSER um, pot of funding, and then as you see, we have accelerated learning, coaching, evidence-based summer learning and enrichment, and there's some on the following slide. Those are uh, subgrants under our large ARP grant. So with the ARP ESSER, um, different ways to utilize our funding, uh, funding, like I had mentioned before, is our before and after school programming. So we do have certain, um, you know, schools write proposals on, you know, the data they have collected, how they can use, um, and, and their student achievement and goals that they'd like to meet with their students, progress they'd like to make. So they developed a proposal for their before and after school programs. And some of those after school and before school programs are funded under our ESSER. Um, if you've attended our board meetings, um, you know, they're also on video on the website. We also have um, dedicated money to a consultant company, Effective School Solutions, ESS, which really focuses on um, supporting all of our stakeholders, um, our students, okay, our teachers. And there's different layers and tiers to our support from ESS. So this particular um, pot of money, I'll call it, our passer, uh, a large part of it is to directly support our students in the services that they provide with social emotional learning, okay? Um, students who are in crisis and um, have to have a fit to return, okay? Those, uh, so it's direct clinical services for our students and fit to returns. And, um, you know, over the course um, of the school year, we see that like with everything that happened with COVID, um, to provide better air quality, you know, in our schools. So that is part of our long range facilities plan. So um, some of the money will be used for those types of facility projects like HVAC, um, projects and that really is a lot of it is to support um, continuing to um, provide better air quality within the schools. Okay. Then this is our first sub grant accelerated learning coaching and educator support. A lot of that is to provide um, you know uh, if anyone did have uh, COVID during the time you know over the past year or so 
we did provide supplemental instruction. So, uh, you know, parents and, you know, we're in contact with um, school principals and school nurses, and the uh, principals work very di diligently to set up um, supplemental instruction for the students. So we basically used our um, teaching staff that, um, you know, uh, applied, and they were able to provide, uh, you know, supplemental instruction on whatever the students you know, needed additional assistance with or might have missed or had questions about while well, they were out with COVID um, during the pandemic. So we did use money for that. Uh, staff uh, stipends to uh, support our learning design teams. So again, those are the stakeholder groups within our schools that are working very hard. They meet regularly um, to look at all those multiple measures of data that we talked about. Um, could be benchmark data, could be FN P scores, um, the Start Strong assessments from the beginning of the year, all of those different data measures they look at and they kind of create like a plan. These are our needs, these are our student needs, this is where we want to go with student growth, and this is how we can kind of get there. So they come together and they discuss other things at those meetings as well, but those are the learning design teams, okay? Really focused on student academic needs and staff professional development and um, staff stipends to um, Dr. Kerrigan had noted that it would be really supportive and helpful to develop secondary assessments for our middle school and high school to have another quality data measure um, and that it would be a little bit more um, consistent for the students throughout the year because as we mentioned before, we do want to continue to look at that student progress throughout the year. So um, he had made a recommendation to create these English and math common unit assessments that will be developed by members of our um, staff. Okay. Then we have the evidence-based summer learning and enrichment. That is another uh, smaller subgrant of money, and that money is being used to provide our students um, summer learning opportunities, such as esports and instrumental music. So um, it provides the salaries to the staff to teach, as well as um, eSports um, does have like um, a good amount of equipment that's needed, so it does uh, fund some of the supplies for eSports. Okay. So that was um, our I have a question. Sure. Oh, yeah. eSports, I mean, I know there are now college opportunities for gaming and things like that. I, I guess I just, you know, I hear so much about people saying our kids on computers, on computers, on computers. How did we decide to fund, use, use this funding to do an esports program versus like a social skills program or something like that? I think um, because we saw the success of it, um, you know, um, I believe it started with um, Dr. Morales um, under technology. Um, we saw such success with it. It's a multitude of different skills that the students are learning. And we found that it seems to be that a lot of the students that kind of gravitate towards the esports are students that aren't like students who would want to go out and play football or basketball or are very athletic. So when I was talking um, with some of the educators at the schools, they were saying, you know, this, this meets a certain group of students that, you know, don't get involved in a lot of other things. Um, and it allows them to be competitive, allows them to be confident. They do work together, you know, as a team. Um, I did get to go when I came in last year in July and observe it. And the students were so engaged and loved it. Um, we actually had the Department of Ed here we walked around with Mr. Richens, and um, you know the, the teacher is phenomenal, first of all. And then uh, secondly, we have a wait list. So many more students wanted to you know, take it. Um, we, we didn't know like, you know, what kind of response we would get, and then we saw it, you know, several requests for it to continue to grow. So um, it is popular, it is out there, it does provide scholarship opportunities, like you know, for post-secondary. And, and I can add that opportunities that there's graphic arts in it yes. there's coding in it um, teamwork the idea of teamwork um, I mean in that sense it is rather social skills yeah um, yeah so okay, so so 
when the funding is done. So then is this something people would pay for in the future, or you hope you get more funding, or? Um, well, I mean, that, that would be above my decision, yeah. but um, just knowing that, you know, in working with Dr. Morales, um, you know, over the past year, um, we have set it up that, you know, because something with grants too is that they really want you to do something meaningful and consistent, and I think that's why we also decided to continue it this year, to serve more of our students, one. And two is a large part of the what's needed is the computers. Um, so we do have a lot of the computers in place already. Um, and then it was able to work with um, our head tech um, director, Dave Suiak, and we have like all the supplies that we should need for you know a decent amount of time, unless we want to continue to grow it even more after we see our you know um, uh, you know student response this summer. Um, but you know we're we're at a good place right now with the the supplies, and it really helps us with like you know uh, funding the staffing for it too. So. Um, yeah, I guess we'll continue to look at the data and see like what the response is this summer. But I do know that when I came in last summer, like you know, Dr. Morales was like, "Oh, let's you know, we should continue this because the kids are loving it and they're really you know finding it very meaningful and they're able to use like a lot of different like, uh, areas at a lot of different skills." Okay. So, curiosity: How many kids were able to go last year? And like, what age was it? Only middle and above, or was it elementary too? It was, it was elementary, it was higher elementary. I remember going into the class and seeing it, but I believe they only did it for a week. It was four one-week sessions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would say there was probably about 80 students that, I think 20 might have been something. When I went in, probably had fewer or something. Yeah. yeah, I could probably tell you, like, if I go back and look at it. I know there's rosters for it, but I all came here from Central, that's where it was held. No. no. Actually, it was high school north. Okay. Yes. And some of our programs are a little different because it was held like, you know, somewhere, but it, like, you know what I mean? Like we had a music program, but it was held at our high school, but it was for the younger kids. Okay. So, yeah. um, so it was somewhere in the district they go. Yes, okay. yeah, one of those schools. We, we somewhere. Our, our school <laughs> our, 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 our no, okay. have our programs in various buildings that aren't being worked on that can, yeah. you know, and change it, yeah. Thank you. Sure, didn't they sure just get like second place or something? I mean, my kids are yeah, involved in it, but I think Thorne, they did really well. And Thompson all did really well. Yeah, I think they did. Yeah. I think Thompson, I mean, I think Thorne got first place. Bayshore got second place. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did really well. Oh, well, it's an okay. after school um, activity. Oh, yeah. sports. Yes. Oh, for during the school year, too. During the school year. It's, it's, after, after, it's like an after school club. It's yeah. like a they, program. They have like, like their own little yeah. esports lab. Yeah. If any of you are on Twitter and follow the schools, a lot of them like to post because they have been doing really well. And so if you're not at all right now, schools, they have the yes. sports club, so it's cool. Hey, Jersey. I'm looking at the picture of it. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Okay, now this is a continuation of um, you know, the previous slide. Uh, this is another sub grant under the um, funding evidence based comprehensive beyond the school guide. So, um, this also um, provided before and after school enrichment for students. So, this was another um, a lot of our uh, before and after school learning um, uh, programs at all of our schools that submitted those proposals that I talked about before. And then, a large um, this whole grant, this whole subgrant, NJTSS mental health support staffing, this is all um, you know focused on mental health. Um, it is uh, stipends for our middle school and high school, and um, the counselors have been doing a really good job implementing restorative practices um, for students who need it. So uh, it's just really a proactive way, and uh, of you know when. There's certain situations with students on, you know, counseling them through it, working with them through it, you know, talking about the, um, you know, choices that they can, they can make, and um, it's been doing very well. And then upgrade and replace of HVAC that's continued from the beginning, um, funding um, different areas of, like I said earlier, with promoting the um, air quality in our schools. So um, the upgrade and replacement of HVAC units you know, after the past two years of uh, COVID. I know, I don't want to keep you guys too long. <laughs> <laughs>
provide the opportunity for, um, you know, I know you've been asking kind of questions as we went along, and feedback. We're always open to and welcome and encourage on feedback. So anything that you may want to share. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a quick question on whether this would fall into one of those areas. First of all, like, um, you know, I liked when you were talking about esports as kind of a, another subset of kids that may not want to do sports or, you know, uh, have those same interests. But for a school like Thompson, we just went through all the tryouts for teams where you have 100 kids try out for a team and they all get cut. And then we have track that you hope then those kids that are cut can join track, but we actually have cuts in track, which other middle schools don't mm -hmm. um, because of the size and, and, and the amount of kids. I mean, is there any way to fund an intramural or maybe another coach for track so they can manage the kids? I just, it's always heartbreaking. You hear these kids that are just so heartbroken that they, they didn't make it, they have nothing to do now for all of spring. And, um, you know, and they're off in search of some club team that they didn't sign up in in time. And it, 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 just, it just seems like a, a unique, issue for like a Thompson, where right. they have all of those kids. And it just came up again um, with the amount of kids that were cut from baseball, from softball. And then I said, oh, well, there's track. And no, they do cut some track. So again, which other schools don't. Um, I just have a question. Do you, you, the kids can't even practice with for no. track? No, they so like not at, at Thorn. They practice, but they don't like the meets. Yeah, like, like, they like, don't have that no, they day one to ratio. Cold, like, if yeah. you're trying out for baseball, you cannot try out for track. And if you don't make baseball, you're done. Yeah. So, like, yeah. my son right now is, yeah. like, lost because he has not made no the yeah. yeah. and, and so, for example, like, cross country, they have a travel team. Mm -hmm. And right. then I'm trying to right. go so, so, so anybody, but, but track, they, they cut. Wow. And baseball, they cut. And you're most, most most sports they cut. Even at wrestling, soccer. No, wrestling, they That's probably because they don't have enough people, actually. You know, if they had enough. There's only a limited amount that can do each sport. Track is a sport that can have a lot, but still there's a limit to what you want to do. But my point is, it seems to be an issue for Well, because of the volume. Exactly. So is there something we can do? All the exactly. And I know this is like, it's related to your question. Um, it doesn't answer your question, but uh, you know, we'll do kind of. Um, with uh, Thompson, like working very closely with Mr. Curry in regards to like, the funding, something that he thought would be very beneficial was a mentoring program for the students after, you know, um, just seeing like the amount of social and emotional needs and you know um, social skills things being needed um, that's something that he he wrote a proposal for so that is something that is funded um, through the ARP grant um, that he is you know actually developing with his staff now um, to work with different sta um, staff members to have a mentoring program within the school and it's Gonna, like, he's made it to be like continuous, so like you know every like you know so students have someone to to go to. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was a very meaningful use of the funds. When you said Thompson, I just thought it out right away because they've been working really hard on it. So um, they set money to kind of like plan it this year and then um, you know launch a mentoring program you know in, uh, in the new school year. So he's been taking a lot of time, and the staff has been. You know, really integral in, in, in putting it together. Because we, we've actually had parents come to the PFA at Thompson and say, "Can you fund right. something for these yeah. two? Because so many have been cut, right? And so many are heartbroken and upset and can't, you know. And it happens every season. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry. That no, I know. So it's just a numbers game. Like, I know you, you can only feel 18 kids. You have 20 try out at one school, and you have 60 try out at another school. In the past, we've had 100 yeah. men try out for boys basketball. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it seems like it's always been a problem. It's, it's, yeah. it's, and, and, and we just, we have to find no, something. I know, especially when we're, we're trying, especially post COVID, trying so hard to encourage these kids to like socialize, be out, find meaning, find structure, find schedule, and they, they want to, but then there's not an opportunity. So can we create more opportunities at the higher populated schools, just more things to do in the afternoon after school? And it's not 
go to the baseball team, maybe you could do baseball intramurals, or maybe you could do something else, even if it's also frisbee, well, yeah. I don't know. Outdoor basketball. Yeah. Right. Well, that we have, well, I mean, there's, I would push for BYA. I know that the problem so, here is that you're kind of saying there's a dates don't match up until we start talking with those groups, because, mm -hmm. like, I know soccer just, it's closed, you can't get it in. So right. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, but I know when I coach from basketball, we only had like four teams and barely had enough for that, so, I mean, we could actually just coordinate with that, so that might be some. That's true, too. I think the, I know for my kids, it's the after school slot is when they have Freedom that they want to do something. Right, but the baseball, I mean, we don't want the baseball, we get yeah. the soccer, but now our dates are closed, so maybe we can work with that that way. Because we have three programs in the area, it doesn't mean this one counts, so maybe there's some. Yeah, I mean, there's a way to combine it, so it is school based. Like there's an element, you know, there's school pride from playing on the school team or being involved in the school club. So just trying to give the kids equal access, access to those opportunities, whereas unfortunately, right now, just based on quantity, something they have no control over, they have a better chance of making a team at certain schools than other teams, or other schools. So, that's a good idea. Any other questions? Any other this is totally different, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the restorative practices, which I know has come up in past meetings, and I know it's been kind of in practice, at least since you know, we came back to school after COVID. Yes. Has, is there any data yet to kind of see how it's working? Are you seeing like less repeat offenders when the kids are, are participating in that in lieu of regular old school detention? Uh, how's it going, I guess is my question. I, I mean, I think that I'm not, you know, in charge of that. Um, that would probably be the best question for Mr. Patrick. Um, but as, as far as like, I just, I get the time sheets for it. So I can say that, you know, um, you know, that students are taking it seriously. And, you know, I think it's a very proactive way to approach, you know, um, you know, different situations that occur. Um, and, you know, the teachers, a lot of them are, are counselors. So they have really good ways of, you know, working with the students and methods to use and strategies. Um, I think it might be a little too soon to tell. Um, you know, like the last you know, thing we talked about, that we said at least in March, you know, and then there's a way down compared. That's great. Yeah, I didn't say any numbers. But it was looking yeah, good. It was looking favorable, so happy. That's great. Because it might be a cool thing to like highlight as a success story within the district. And then as any parent, especially of like, you know, middle and high school, it's like sometimes I don't know how to deal with my kids. So if there's tips that can be shared that are more stories and like I'm just taking your device away, you know, something, another strategy that we can then employ at home that marries with what, how the school's addressing it, I think we could all learn from that, especially if it's working well with the schools. I know I, you know, I'll take any advice I can get. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, so I really value your time. I, I respect your time. I appreciate you coming out in the weather today. Well, hopefully it looks it's like clearing up a little bit. Um, our next PAC meeting is May 4th, and I just wanted to say thank you again for your time and, and feedback. Have a great day.